you can make a clear. Order. 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 We have a special show focusing on the GCSB Mass Surveillance Bill that is about to become law next week. Joining me to discuss the political, legal and philosophical ramifications of this legislation, he is one of New Zealand's most respected civil liberty advocates, Dr Rodney Harrison QC, and he is one of Parliament's most vocal human rights supporters, the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, Grant Robertson. Welcome to you both. The Thank GCSB you. bill represents the largest erosion of our civil liberties since the 51 waterfront lockout. It turns the GCSB away from its sole focus of spying on the intelligence apparatus of foreign nations to spying on all New Zealanders. But here's the twist. This legislation changes the focus of the GCSB from just national security to economic security. That means any union fighting corporations, any environmentalist fighting mining corporations, or anyone who downloads a file illegally could now have their entire digital footprint spied upon. It gets worse. The changing of the search warrant from individuals to class of people means vast numbers of us will be trawled and spied upon for nothing more than guilt by association. Dr. Harrison John Key says you are wrong and that this legislation represents better checks and balances. How does a poorly resourced panel of two equate to an appropriate check and balance of this type of surveillance? Well, I don't think that surveillance of overbroad powers can work. If your powers uh, are overreaching and unnecessarily so, then uh, what can the panel do about that? Uh, the other um, type of surveillance is the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee, but that um, continues to be limited to uh, surveillance of uh, financial performance. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no select, robust select committee process that enables uh, the actual activities uh, to be looked at. Is that concerning for democracy? Oh, I think it is. Um, I, I think that the, the substantive powers issue is more concerning, uh, but if you put it all together, then it's a serious concern. What are your major concerns with this piece of legislation? Well, um, that contrary to what um, John Key was saying on television last night, uh, the, the bill would permit wholesale spying um, on New Zealanders. Uh, rebutting his claim that it doesn't uh, takes a little bit of work. You've and we can time. come back You've to got the time. I've got the time now? Please do. All right. Well, basically, it's a, the problem compared to the existing act is a combination of expanded function and expanded power of, um, of interception and gathering of data. Mm. You put the two together, you are, you are moving well away from the current regime which is aimed at um, uh, securing and analyzing foreign intelligence. Uh, the, what Mr. Key was saying was, it's all right, uh, none of this will happen except under a warrant. Mm. But that ignores the, the new powers. There's, there's an interception uh, capacity That's under right. an interception warrant. And there's this thing called a, uh, uh, an access authorization. And let me just read what that is. It's an authorization uh, to access one or more specified information infrastructures or class classes of information infrastructures that the Bureau cannot otherwise lawfully access. Now, mm. an information infrastructure is almost anything electronic, uh, computer, um, phone, um, um, ISP, telephone network, and information infrastructure includes the content on it. Mm. So it's a hugely uh, uh, broad concept. And the section, section 14 uh, of the bill protects or attempts to protect the private communications of New Zealand citizens and those with per permanent residence. But 
its protection is against the interception. Yes. So that's mm. the war Just, interception yes. warrant yes. side but of it. But not the application. It doesn't, it yeah. doesn't protect this hugely no. broad access right. authorization. And that is, that is to be issued by the Prime Minister or maybe the Prime Minister and one other. So where, where is the protection in that? Uh, can I just add, yep. I, I, I've got a bit of a bee in my bond about this private communication yes. issue. There's, there's, there's three major things wrong with it. First of all, it definitely doesn't include metadata mm -hmm. or what people are now calling keystrokes. Mm -hmm. yep. um, uh, the recording of what you do when on the internet, what sites you visit, uh, and so on. So those aren't private communications. Mm. Secondly, private communication does not include a communication as to content that um, people have a reasonable expectation will be intercepted sure. by a third party, sure. Sure. a self-fulfilling prophecy. And thirdly, and most overlooked in all this debate, the, the private communication protections are limited to New Zealand residents mm -hmm. and uh, those with permanent residence and New Zealand citizens. It doesn't cover all others lawfully in New yes, Zealand. It doesn't yes. cover uh, New Zealand NGOs mm -hmm. or New Zealand businesses. Mm. So it's a, it's a really a pretty illusory uh, protection and I just completely disagree with the Prime Minister when he says uh, that uh, this doesn't authorise wholesale uh, interception of communications. Grant, we saw an extraordinary performance by John Key last night on Campbell Live, where our Prime Minister exhibited all the charm of a sociopath. How can it be that he is right and everybody else is wrong? Well, it can't be. And I think that what it shows is actually that John Key has got himself well and truly out of touch with where New Zealanders are on mm. this issue, particularly young New Zealanders. And I think the feedback I'm getting just, just um, earlier today in, in an airport, a young person coming up to me to talk about this issue because they knew who I was, because they lived their lives on the internet. Mm. And I think you know one of the things John Key tried to do last night was say everybody else is wrong without actually rebutting those claims, but also to hark back constantly to the 2003 Act. The reality is, 10 years ago, no one was talking about metadata. Mm. It wasn't within the discourse of this legislation. And that's why 10 years on, we need to have a proper conversation as New Zealanders about what we expect of these agencies. And John Key came along last night with an army of straw men to put up to try and make out that this legislation was really all under control and all able to be dealt with in a, in a way that New Zealanders would be comfortable with. The concerns that Rodney's just been raising weren't put to him directly last night. And I think it would be good if we could actually have that conversation as New Zealanders, come up with something that would at least have broad support. Dr Harrison, Section 14 prohibits the GCSB from intercepting New Zealanders' private communications for purpose 8B intelligence gathering, as you pointed out. But they can do so for the purpose of 8A cyber security. That's just meaningless double talk, isn't it? Well, uh, certainly there is an intelligence gathering function under 8A right. cyber security. And uh, um, I heard John Key last night uh, liken the 8A function to <laughs> a larger version of Norton Norton antivirus. antivirus yeah. may, may, may I, I be permitted to say, yeah, right, where, where can I uninstall it from my computer? <laughs> yes, indeed. But indeed. I mean, that is a very important point, which is that by being able to dress up 8A as a protection mm. mechanism, um, that you know is meant to provide reassurance to New Zealanders. If you read the law, in the course of protecting, enormous power is being granted. In Section 8A, a, you can drive a truck through that's the right. definitions there of what is covered by this. But that's the big change. The Section 14 in the last Act that protected New Zealanders didn't specify which sections it applied to. Mm, mm. It applied across the board. Mm. Now, we can get into the argument of, of what assistance the agency might have given, but the premise of the law was that New Zealanders were protected from the activities of the GCSB. The new Section 14 is only on that intelligence gathering Section 8B. That is a big difference. What is the point, Grant, of receiving statistics of how many people have been spied on after the fact, <laughs> and some mythical review in 2015, are those enough of a defence of an overzealous state? No, I mean, look, 
We grant, even today now, before this bill passes, we grant incredibly intrusive powers to the GCSB. Mm. Now, somebody like me can justify that, you know, on, the, on, on various grounds. But the corollary has to be the strongest and mo most robust oversight that you can get. That is not what is at play here. And again, as we move more into the role of the GCSB in the cyber world, you need greater protections and greater oversight. And the Inspector General, look, there's some improvements in the office and having a deputy and all of that kind of thing, but that's all after the fact. And, well, and the way in which we, we go about, you know, when you have the Legislation Advisory Committee coming to the Select Committee and saying we should have more of a judicial role in this, mm. I think the government should be listening to this. Question to both of you, where the Prime Minister says there are plenty of legal checks and balances within this legislation, what's your response? Well, as I've said before, I just don't accept that there are. Um, what we've, our starting point is that these activities are covert. So they, generally speaking, they will not come to attention unless mm. there's a, a muck up. Um, and that happens occasionally, as we've seen. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the checks and balances need to extend to, par uh, to parliamentary scrutiny. Um, there is a very real danger that those who uh, operate behind the scenes and, uh, and share classified information get captured. Um, that has happened in the past, and I see nothing in this, apart from the two little Santa's helpers, mm. uh, which I don't think um, is really meaningful, to suggest that capture can't occur in the future. It's Isn't interesting. It? There's, there are a lot of different models overseas, and this is the kind of thing we should be looking at if we had a proper inquiry. So in Australia, no minister can serve on their oversight committee. Right. If you go to Norway, you've got a committee where no politicians are on it. Mm. It's exclusively drawn from people from civil society mm -hmm. so that they're providing that check and balance on behalf of, of all of the citizens. Now, I'm not backing any particular one of those options, but they quite clearly point to the fact you can have oversight that is much more, more stringent than a committee chaired by the person who's in charge of signing off all the warrants. Dr Harrison, in light of the Snowden revelations, what guarantee do New Zealanders have that any information collected by the GCSB won't be handed on to the NSA? Well, none in my view. The, the legislation does not deal with uh, what is to happen to the information once it's obtained and stored. It doesn't prohibit, um, indeed it contemplates, that information being transferred overseas. Um, and it doesn't say how, how long it should be held uh, for or anything like that. And uh, even Peter Dunn has conceded uh, that the bill doesn't do that, but somewhat flippantly he says he doesn't think it needs to address that issue. Uh, and, and these, uh, uh, alongside the Snowden revelations, um, as I have argued before, this is precisely the time um, where we should be um, pausing and having a look at the bigger picture of how this legislation and what the GCSB is, does and is uh, being empowered to do fits in with our um, other relationships. And uh, John Key uh, simply refuses to disclose what the specific activities mm. are. Mm. Um, and he would, I don't think he said it the other night, but he would no doubt say that that is operational or sensitive and so on. My response to that is, I'm sorry, if you are going to try um, want to increase powers of surveillance on New Zealanders and others, uh, then you've got to justify. You don't have to identify that you're engaging in this specific operation mm. or that specific inquiry. But in gen general terms, uh, the GCSB should be called upon to explain what activities it is in fact going to carry out under these powers and spe especially how those interface with Five Eyes and Talk Waihopai. Grant, mm. talking about those wider uh, relationships, the Pacific is now the new Cold War friction point between America and China, with America seeing the TPPA as a national security measure rather than a free trade agreement. Is the haste of this GCSB legislation to coincide with Obama's desire in October 
to announce the TPPA signed. I mean, what's going on in the wider yeah. geopolitical place? I mean, on that specific point, I, I don't think there's a hope in Hades of the TPP being signed in right. October this year. Too much domestic... Uh, yeah, well, there's a, there's, there are still and new players coming in when, yep. when Japan and, and Mexico and so on have come into the TPP. That's going to slow that process right down. Yep. I do think that clearly, you know, there's a view that the US holds about this, and we've seen it with all the Snowden revelations and so on. That's the very moment when New Zealand needs to decide what is the New Zealand way mm. of dealing with yeah. security mm. and intelligence. Mm. And this has evolved over a 10-year period since the act was, was last looked at. Your very point in that question about the rise of China and the Pacific and mm. all of that, this is the moment for New Zealanders to have the conversation about what is the New Zealand way for security and intelligence. And that, to me, is the one single consistent message I have heard on this. There's a variety of views about whether the GCSB should exist or it shouldn't or whatever, but the clear, consistent message that I think John Key is, is deaf to is that New Zealanders want to have these agencies set up in our way, reflecting our values. Do you feel these, uh, the GCSB will be answering to Washington or Wellington? Well, I mean, that's obviously the concern everybody's got, isn't it? That, and, and in many ways, as a small player in a global alliance, we've always been in that position mm. to some mm. extent. What we now have to ask ourselves with the incredible array of interception and, and, and observation capabilities, what are the protections New Zealanders are looking for? And the bit that John Key has been, in my view, dishonest about from day one mm. is whether this bill represents an expansion of the function and yeah. powers. Yeah. It does. If so, now is not the time to be rushing through with that. Now's the time to be pausing. Dr. Harrison, in the Ahmed Zawi case, uh, you faced the Labour government convinced of Zawi's guilt as a terrorist with very little evidence. The case reeked of external influences. With these types of surveillance intrusions, how does the individual defend themselves against an all-seeing state? Well, uh, it, it, it certainly is difficult and frustrating. It's, it's like uh, boxing with shadows to try and get information out of any security agency. Um, the um, the Zawi case is a typical example where it took months of just scraping away progressively to get hold of uh, information, but it happens. It's not just with the sort of the post 9/11 su suspected terrorist. It 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 happens in other areas. Um, in our public service, many people are required to have security clearances, mm -hmm. uh, and we're getting on to the the security intelligence service rather than the GCSB mm. here. Yeah. But um, that's their function. Um, a and if there's an adverse security clearance for the individual to clear their name uh, when they're told that, that they can't be told, you know, what the agency's does it get got against them. Does it? Oh, very, yeah, very, it definitely does. Um, uh, it's amazing what you can do if you're resourced enough and persistent enough, but, you know, um, th th these are the problems uh, of a surveillance state. Um, I'm not sure that this bill is really impacting on that directly. Right. Um, Grant, the interception warrant process requires key signature and the commission of security warrants, who was appointed by the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. and it should it would be carried out by the head of the GCSB, who just happens <laughs> to be an old school chum of John Key. Of course, John Key initially hid the relationship and uh, personally called him to apply. This is a vast amount of power for one person to have, isn't it? It's huge. And, and it's the power to grant the warrants. It's the power to appoint the director. It's being the chair of the committee that oversees the agency. It's being the person who sets the agenda of that committee. It's an extraordinary amount of power. And to me, that is one of the things that we do need to relook at. I mean, one example of that is that if we had a proper inspector general um, overseeing this, they should be an officer of parliament, in mm. my opinion. Mm. They should actually not act immediately on behalf of the prime minister. Um, his role is all-encompassing in this. And what we've seen over this period with John Key is how what problems that can cause. I mean, the appointment of Ian Fletcher to that role was a disgraceful abuse of the mm. process of appointments. Mm. The actual process of appointments that's now outlined in the new bill isn't a bad one. The problem is the Prime Minister ran roughshod across that to appoint his mate. Question of both of you. Uh, historically, the security apparatus of New Zealand seemed to have been obsessed 
with the sex lives of Green Party members <laughs> and the intimate details of communists and unionists. What assurances are that any of the future targets of this legislation will be any more legitimate? Well, uh, there are, I could say in fairness that there are, there, are, there are now more principles in, in the bill as reported back, although it, it, that section is, is quite extraordinary um, in that it giveth and then it taketh away <laughs> yes. by saying um, the GC, just take the Bill of Rights, which yep. is the most yep. obvious limit on power. It says the GCSB is bound to observe the Bill of Rights, which is what the existing law already said. It says, however, not in any specific instance. Yeah. Um, and I, I personally would argue that that uh, leaves us worse off than if they hadn't made sure. put that provision in at all, because yeah. what it's saying is the GCSB is bound but not bound to obey the Bill of Rights in the particular case. And what's more, there can be no complaint about its failure to. <laughs> uh, we, we've seen that Keith Locke was spied on since he was a kid for crying out loud. You know, <coughs> We just found out uh, today that the CIA have been spying on Noam Chomsky most of his life. Who are the, who, who, who's the threat here? Well, um, who knows in, in the case of Keith Locke but the, and, and indeed Noam Chomsky, but... The point here is that this is, a, I know I'm harping on about the review, but this again is why we can't just see the GCSB in isolation. Mm. Remember, there was a review of the SIS underway. Yep. And in fact, as far as we're aware, legislation was being drafted around that. That suddenly got pulled out. We have to see all of these agencies together. There was no off-cans, the police's um, intelligence arm, when the 2003 bill was written. Mm. But to come back to the question that you just asked, I mean, one of my favourite sections of this whole bill is section 15A5, which is in the section that Rodney was referring to around earlier on around the, the authorisation process. And it reads, this section applies despite anything in any other act. I mean... I know the lawyers will probably say, well, that's got some, you know, that's circumscribed in some way, but to me that's quite symbolic of the fact that you have to be very careful about what Mr. Key might say are the intent of these provisions right. and the wording that's actually on the paper. Dr. Harrison, as a lawyer, are you concerned with the recent examples of police having no problems intercepting the communications between lawyers and their clients, and do you think these new surveillance powers makes that intrusion more likely? Well, they, uh, un under the GCSB bill, they have heeded what the Law Society says, and I should have added that I'm not speaking for the of Law course, Society. Of course, of course. I'm speaking yep. personally here. But the Law Society said, well, y you're empowering the, um, the interception of privileged communications, particularly lawyer-client mm, privilege, mm. which is a pretty high, highly valued... Um, um, a communication, although I have to say that there are a lot of other communications that that are uh, significant as well, which aren't covered. So that what they've done is they have attempted to protect privilege between lawyer and client, but on a n more n a narrower basis than the, in the SIS Act. Right. The SIS Act permits uh, prohibits uh, in, uh, interception of all pr legally privileged communications, but they've stuck with communications between um, uh, lawyers and New Zealand citizens and permanent residents. Right, so again, so it could be any of the if, other... If it's, if, it's a, if it's a privileged c a communication of Fonterra's tough luck, <laughs> it can be intercepted. It, uh, it, just, it's, it really is completely illogical. And it comes back to the point that it's not been thought through, it's been rushed through. Um, and and I want to talk about just the, the, the travesty of democracy, if I may, if we have time, yeah, yeah. in a moment. Uh, Grant, as a politician, are you concerned with the recent examples of politicians and journalists being spied upon? And if the authorities are this flippant with your mm. and journalists' privacy, how concerned should be, should be the, the general public who don't have that kind of status? Well, I mean, the person who should be really concerned about that is Peter Dunn, because he was at the centre of where the Prime Minister's office intervened um, had an agency, the Parliamentary Service, that actually has in its act that it is not an arm of executive government. Mm. The Prime Minister's Office came in and told them what to do. Peter Dunn is now the person who's refusing to draw the connection between what happened with the Andrea Vance situation 
and this bill. Mm. He's the one who could be voting it down yeah. when we come back to the House next week. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say, it, it is typical, unfortunately, of this national government that doesn't respect the rule of law or the process and separation that we've traditionally seen. I think we better wrap the show here. Uh, Rodney, your final word. What are your final words? Well, words? I mean, this whole business with the, the done deal and the fact that we look, we're looking at a single vote majority has set me thinking very seriously about the way our parliamentary process operates with the party whip. Um, it, what it means is that it, despite a very controversial and complex piece of legislation, no MP in government, or one could say also out of it, is actually uh, required to consider these changes on their intrinsic merits against basic human rights standards. Mm. Uh, it, everyone is, uh, with the exception of the two independents, Banks and Dunn, everyone is being whipped into passing the legislation. Mm. Now, we expect um, plumbers, uh, generally trades and professions, to operate to a minimum standard of competence and, and diligence. Mm. Uh, where is that being shown by our politicians? Mm. Grant, your final word. Well, I think, you know, I've come to the position in my life that I think we need these intelligence agencies in New Zealand. But because of the powers that we give them, we have to act to circumscribe those powers and to ensure we have robust oversight. This bill goes in the opposite direction. It increases and expands the powers and functions. Uh, the, the oversight that comes over the top is weak um, compared to the powers that have been granted. New Zealanders want to have a conversation about the way in which a New Zealand security agency operates. Let's make it a New Zealand way. This bill is being rushed through because John Key hates talking about these issues, but he should be talking. My last point, we must not forget there is a companion bill mm. to this legislation. Mm. The mm. Telecommunications Interception and Capability Bill is on a slower track through mm. Parliament. But what is being done here to the functions and powers of the GCSB gets its relevance and operation under the TICS bill. Every telecommunication provider in New Zealand has submitted against that bill. Mm. Most of the large digital businesses in New Zealand have submitted against this bill. Right. And there is still further fight to go, whatever happens with this bill. <coughs> Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Dr. Harrison, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to my final word. I'm right and everyone else is wrong. It's great for five-year-olds and absolute monarchs. Not so great, however, it's the pro if it's the Prime Minister of your country. Do we really want someone with that level of God complex signing off on warrants to be spied upon? Key's quick-footed denials and smile and wave laid-back demeanour belies what the legislation really allows for. When John Campbell last night challenged him on the numerous means the GCSB has to extend these powers into mass surveillance, Key said, I don't go into those individual points by individual points, he meant all the methods that the GCSB could extend this legislation into mass surveillance. Ludicrously, the Prime Minister claimed that the GCSB was really like Norton antivirus. That's right, folks. It's not a mass surveillance program feeding NSA directly through GCSB. It's a governmental electronic condom. The Prime Minister declared that he doesn't have enough time to do media interviews to justify the GCSB. But he does have time to be on more FM with Cyan Gazza in the morning to announce Al-Qaeda trained terrorists living in New Zealand. If you want to show your opposition to this nonsense, I'm hosting a public meeting at the Auckland Town Hall this Monday at 7pm, which will also be live streamed on the Daily Blog. Thanks for watching Fano. Good night Aotearoa. I'll see you at the Town Hall on Monday. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on